Okay, in this video, we're gonna do number one from the 2022 Calc A, B, and B, C exam. So they both had the same first question and it's kind of like a working with a rate of change problem. So let's take a look at what it says. Uh, from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m., the rate at which the vehicles, uh, the rate at which vehicles arrive at a certain toll plaza is given by A of T, which is 450 root sine of 0.62 T where T is the number of hours after 5 a.m. and A of T is measured in vehicles per hour. Traffic is flowing smoothly at 5 a.m. with no vehicles waiting in line. All right, so for part A, we want to write, but do not evaluate, that's really interesting to me, an integral expression that gives the total number of vehicles that arrive at the toll plaza between basically T equals one and T equals five. All right, so we are trying to figure out uh, the total number of vehicles that arrive, that would be uh, an integral of the rate at which they're arriving, and it turns out in the problem, the rate at which the vehicles arrive is A of T, so for this problem, all we really want to do is the integral from 1 to 5 of a of t dt. And since the function is named a of t, you don't need to write 450 root sine of 0.62t. We don't have to evaluate this. That's literally all we needed to do. I feel like that's a problem where they try to get you to understand how the problem is working. Um, so let's move on to part b and see what we're now going to do with this idea. All right, part b. Find the average value of the rate in vehicles per hour at which vehicles arrive at the toll plaza from t equals 1 to t equals 5. So the average value of the rate. So average value in general is integral over interval. So we're going to do the integral of the function that gives us the rate divided by the interval on which we're searching, which is from 1 to 5. All right, so that's going to be the integral from 1 to 5 of a of t dt, which I guess is why you didn't have to do it in part a, because we're just gonna calculate some stuff here anyway, um, divided by five minus one. So the integral of the rate over the interval, which is five minus one. This is a calculator question. So um, we're gonna get our answer by storing a of t. Maybe you don't store it, maybe you just use it. It's up to you. I always store functions, storing a of t, and then uh, doing the integral over the interval, I got 375.5. 537, um, and that's going to be the units for the average value of a function are the same as the units of the function. So A of T is measured in vehicles per hour. So the average value of A of T is also vehicles per hour, which is just further evidence that we've done this or set it up correctly because our answer should be in vehicles per hour. All right, pretty good. Next up, is the rate at which vehicles arrive at the toll plaza at t equals one, increasing or decreasing. So we're looking for if the rate is increasing or decreasing, the rate is A of t, right? So um, this was our rate. We're looking for whether the rate is increasing or decreasing. I'm gonna find A prime and evaluate it at one. But again, it's a calculator question. So I need A prime of one. I'm not doing that by hand. Even if I did, I wouldn't know sine of 0.62 um, or cosine. So I just, I've stored the function um, and I found the derivative of that function at one. I got approximately 148.947, so I'm gonna write that down. That's greater than zero, and now I'm just gonna write up my solution. So I'm gonna say, since a prime of one is greater than zero, the rate at which vehicles arrive at the toll plaza, and then that rate is a of t, so I'm gonna say comma a of t. Um, I don't think you need that, because it's, you know, it is the rate, is increasing, increasing because greater than zero. So is increasing um, at t equals one. And then t equals one was 6 a.m. Never sure what they mean uh, when they say like, you know, but they didn't really ask us to give a context. They asked for a reason, but t equals one is like, you know, that's the math part. 6 a.m. is the real world part. So I thought I should throw it in. All right, let's take a look at the next part, which is a line forms whenever a of t is greater than or equal to 400. Okay, so it's not always greater than 400, so we're gonna have to figure that out. The number of vehicles in line at time t for a is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to four is given by n of t, which is the integral from a to t of a of x minus 400 dx, where a is the time when the line first begins to form. So the first time that we hit 400 cars is when is a, that's a value of a. To the nearest whole number, find the greatest number of vehicles in line at the toll plaza and the time interval from A to four, justify your answer. 
This to me sounds like a candidate's test problem. Um, and so that's basically how I'm going to choose to do it. We're looking for the absolute maximum on a closed interval. Candidate's test for sure. All right, so first of all, I need to know when A of T is greater than or equal to 400. So what I've done is I've graphed A of T. That picture is really small. Um, I can make it bigger, but then uh, it might obscure something later on. But you know what, I'll just do this. There we go. Okay, so that's a little bigger. Um, so A of T is first equal to 400 at uh, 1.46937. So what I've done is I've written A of T equals 400 because T is approximately uh, 1.46937. Now I know there's another value. That value is gonna come into play in a second, but not right now. Um, and I'm gonna say this is A because that's the first time, right? So I'm setting that equal to A. Now, I wanna use a candidate's test. To use the candidate's test, I need N to be continuous. Um, so I'm gonna write up how I set up the candidate's test every time. N is continuous, I'm not gonna justify that because uh, A is continuous on the interval and so N is differentiable and differentiability implies continuity. There's, I think, no way they wanted you to go through all those hoops on this. So I'm just gonna say, N of T is continuous, therefore the absolute maximum is either at an end point or at a critical point. So the end points are A and four. Now we're gonna need critical points and it's not like immediately obvious, so I think that we should show how we're getting the critical points. So I'm gonna say that N prime of T is A of T minus 400, second fundamental theorem, uh, equals zero. And then I need to know when that happens. Well, that happens, so I, I wasn't thinking when I did the problem. That's obviously gonna happen at uh, 1.46937 and at 3.59771, but I accident, well not accidentally, I just did it again. Um, and this again is really small. Let me beef this up a little bit. Okay, so um, 3.5977 is the critical point on the interval. So I said T is approximately 3.59771 and I'm setting that equal to P because I don't wanna write that number again. Okay, so after I did that, what I'm gonna do is make a table of values for the function n, and I need to evaluate at the endpoints, which are a and four, and at this critical point, which I've called p. So my table looks like this, it's just t and then n of t. The values I want are at a, p, and four, and then I use the calculator to get those values. So because I had already named the function a, the calculator wouldn't let me store the value as a, so I just stored it as a1. So that's why I've defined n of t to be the integral from a1 to t of a of x minus 400. And uh, you can see that I got zero, I got 71, and I got 62 because the question is to the nearest, um, to the nearest whole number. So 71 is our maximum, so let's write that up. Therefore, the max number of vehicles on a to four is 71 vehicles. So we have used the candidate's test. I didn't say by candidate's test. You don't usually need to name it. Perhaps I should have said uh, by candidate's test, the absolute max is at the end point or the critical point. That'd be a better answer, um, but it's not what I did. All right, so that was number one from uh, 2022. All right, in this video, we're gonna do number two from the 2022 Calc AB exam, um, and it's kind of the area volume problem. So let's see what it has to offer. Uh, let f and g be the functions defined by f of x equals the natural log of x plus three, and g of x is x to the fourth plus two x cubed. The graphs of f and g are shown above, but I put them below in the corner, um, intersect at negative two and at x equals b, where b is greater than zero. Um, and so for the first part, we wanna find the area of the region enclosed by the graphs of f and g. So what I've done, I need to find b, right? So I uh, graphed both of them, I found the intersections. Obviously one of them is at negative two, zero, because we were told x equals negative two. The other one is at 0 0.781975, and I'm gonna store that on my calculator as B. Um, so here's the work for that. F of X equals G of X gives negative two and approximately 0.781975 equals B. And now I'm just gonna to refer to B throughout because I've already defined it. So to do area, I just have to do top takeaway bottom on the interval. So that's going to be the integral from negative two to B of the top function is the natural log function, so that's f of x, and then the bottom function is g of x, and then dx, and now we need to find that value, so it's calculator, 
Um, I use the calculator page. You could also use bounded area, which uh, thinking about it would have been faster, but I've stored F, I've stored G, I did the integral, I get 3.604, so approximately 3.604, and that's part A. All right, nice. that's pretty straightforward um, as far as area goes. Let's look at the next part. For negative 2 to B, let H of X be the vertical distance between the graphs of F and G. Is H increasing or decreasing at X equals negative 0.5? So it's going to be important that we get the top and bottom curve correct here. Um, for the area, we already had to work that out, so we know that the natural log is on top. Um, here's a picture of the distance, right? So we're looking for the distance. That's that vertical line that I just drew down there. That's the distance. So it's really h of x is just top takeaway bottom. So h of x is f of x minus g of x. And then the question is, is h of x increasing or decreasing? So we're going to find the derivative. We're going to find h prime of negative 0.5. And it's calculator, so we're just doing it on the calculator. Um, so I get h prime of negative 0.5 is actually exactly negative 0.6. It's not an approximation. That warning there, though, um, is that the domain might be bigger than, uh, domain of the derivative might be bigger than the domain of the original, which is true because when you take the derivative of natural log, you put a variable in the denominator. So it does change the domain, not relevant on this problem, but it is a good warning. So I get h prime is negative, which means that h is decreasing. So I'm going to write up since h prime of negative 0.5 is less than zero, the vertical distance between f and g is decreasing at x equals negative 0.5. All right, let's take a look at the next part. So, the region enclosed by the graphs of f and g is the base of a solid. Cross sections of the solid taken perpendicular to the x-axis are squares. Find the volume of the solid. All right, so this is uh, area, volume with known cross sections, right? And also keep in mind, we already know what b is from part a where we had to solve for it, so we're allowed to just bring that forward with us. Um, so to find the volume with area of known cross sections, we just integrate, sorry, volume with known cross sections. What we want to do is just integrate the area of a cross section. So we have to work out the area of a cross section. Well, that's the cross section in the XY plane. Um, and on that base, we're going to build a square. The area of a square is side squared. So if one side of the square is F of X minus G of X, the area is F of X minus G of X quantity squared. So areas of cross sections are really, volumes of, why am I messing that up? Volumes with known cross sections are important and you should definitely review that before any AP exam. Um, so squares are side squared and then, you know, you can have all kinds of things, equilateral triangles, semicircles, um, described, uh, described cross sections where it's like a, a rectangle where you know the base is 10 times the height or something like that. All right. To find our volume, we need to integrate this. So the volume is going to be the integral from negative 2 to b of our area formula, which is f of x minus g of x quantity squared, and then dx, calculator question. So I just punched it into the calculator. Um, calculator gives me 5.340. So I'll say this is approximately 5.340. I go three decimals no matter what. Um, even if the last decimal is a zero, I like to be able to look at all my numerical values and be like, yes, I use three decimals. So that's why I'm putting a zero there. You don't really need it, but I would recommend it. All right, next up. A vertical line in the XY plane travels from left to right along the base of the solid described in part C. So that's just picture a vertical line and just move it through the region. Um, that's what's happening. Um, the vertical line is moving at a constant rate of seven units per second. So it's moving left to right at seven units per second, that's like a dx dt situation, right? Because a vertical line has equation x equals, I don't know, 10. That's a vertical line. It's moving, so dx dt is seven. We want to find the rate of change of the area of the cross section above the vertical line. So remember what we're doing here is we have this. This is in the xy plane, and on that segment, we build a square. So it comes out of the xy plane. It goes into space. Like if you drew that segment on your paper, that square that I just drew or tried to draw would be perpendicular to your paper, so it would just be coming out of your desk or whatever. Um, so we're trying to find the rate of change of the area of that cross-section above the vertical line with respect to time 
when the vertical line is at x equals negative 0.5. Okay, so we're trying to find the rate of change of the area of the cross section. We know the area of the cross section because from the previous part, we said that the area of a cross section is just going to be the quantity f of x minus g of x. That's the side of the square, and area is side squared, so squared. Now, what are we trying to find in this problem? We want the rate of change of the area with respect to time. Right now, the area is a function of x, not a function of time. We are looking for dA dt, and we know by the chain rule that dA dt should be dA dx times dx dt. So if I can find dA dx when x is negative 0.5 and multiply it by dx dt, which we know is 7, that's going to be my answer. So that's what I'm going to try to do. So dA dt is going to end up being, at x equals negative 0.5, uh, a prime of negative 0.5 times 7. And it's a calculator question, thankfully. So I had the calculator find the derivative of a of x at x equals negative 0.5, negative 1.32455. Then I just took that and multiplied by 7 because I just have to get the numerical value. So dA dt here is going to be approximately negative 9.272, and that's my answer. That's the end of this question. Okay, in this video, we're going to do number three from the 2022 Calc A, B, and Calc B, C exams. They had the same problem, number three. It's going to be a problem where you're given a graph of the derivative and asked all kinds of questions about it. So let's see what we can do. Let f be the differentiable function with f of 4 equals 3. On the interval from 0 to 7, the graph of f prime, the derivative of f, consists of a semicircle and two line segments, as shown in the figure. All right, we want to find f of 0, find f of 5. This is a fundamental theorem of calculus problem. So to find f of 0, what I'm going to want to do is take the value that I know, which is f of 4, and then uh, because 4 is bigger, uh, then 0, I'm going to have to subtract the integral from 0 to 4. Like normally, you would say that the integral from 0 to 4 is, the, z the integral from 0 to 4 of f prime is f of 4 minus f of 0, but since we know f of 4, we want to go backwards to f of 0, we have to subtract off that definite integral. And now this is kind of an area problem. So uh, that semicircle has a radius of 2, a circle with a radius of 2 has an area of 4 pi, um, I don't know, but then we're taking, oh yeah, yeah, oh, well, that's weird that I wrote, like, the wrong thing there. Um, I should have written, uh, negative 2 pi there. I'm gonna fix that. I'm gonna try to fix that. The full, uh -oh. the full circle would have had an area of 4 pi. This is half of it, so this is 2 pi, and we're below the axis, so negative 2 pi. All right, so, apologies, hopefully this goes better going forward. I'm pretty sure it will. We'll see. Um, so f of 0 is going to be 3 minus the negative 2 pi that we found. And so that's just going to be 3 plus 2 pi. So that's f of 0. Now next we need to find f of 5. f of 5, we know f of 4, so we're going forward this time. So that's going to be f of 4 plus the displacement from 4 to 5, so plus the definite integral from 4 to 5 of f prime of x dx. All right, and then I'm going to again... Look at my graph. This is uh, half of the square that has an area of 1, so that area is going to be 1 half. And uh, so we're going to say f of 5 is 3 plus 1 half, which is 3.5 or 7 halves, whichever one you want to use. All right, let's take a look at part, part B. Find the x-coordinates of all points of inflection of the graph of f on 0 to 7 and justify your answer. All right, so this is the graph of f prime that we are shown which means all of the places that f prime goes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing are the points of inflection. So at x equals 2 and at x equals 6, I'm going to use a slightly different justification, though, because I prefer to use this. So I'm going to say f of x has point of inflection at x equals 2 and x equals 6. My reasoning is going to be because f prime um, has relative extrema at those values. That's the easiest way to justify it. Otherwise, I'd have to say because f prime changes from decreasing to increasing or increasing to decreasing at those points. Both justifications are good. I just prefer this one where I talk about relative extrema. I really like that justification. I use it whenever I can. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Let g be the function defined by g of x equals f of x minus x. 
on what intervals, if any, is G decreasing between zero and seven? Show uh, the analysis that leads to your answer. All right, so um, I'm gonna have to find the derivative and then figure out when the derivative is negative, right? Because that's how you figure out when something is decreasing. So G prime of X is going to be F prime of X minus one. So if g of x is decreasing, I would need g prime to be less than zero. So I need to figure out what's going on there, right? g prime is less than zero would mean that f prime is less than one. So now I need to look at the graph and figure out where f prime is less than one. So if I go to the graph, I'm gonna add in the line at y equals one because I have the graph of f prime, I just need to know where this graph is less than one and now I can visually see it, right? This intersection point is five, one and until I get to that intersection point, f prime is below one. So that's the region on which g is decreasing. So now I'm just gonna write that up. I'm gonna say that g is decreasing on the interval from zero to five. And then my reasoning for that is gonna be because g prime is less than zero on that interval. So I did the analysis though, right? You can see I, I showed g prime is less than zero implies that f prime is less than one. That's my reasoning there. Um, so I would be showing all of this work. Obviously, when I do these problems, I show exactly what I would show on the AP exam if I was taking it. So all of this would be my work. Let's take a look at the next part. For the function g defined in part c, so that was um, g of x is f of x minus x, find the absolute minimum value on the interval from zero to seven, justify your answer. So we need the value, we don't just need the coordinate. Um, so let's see if we can figure this out. So g of x is definitely a continuous function. So I'm gonna say g of x is continuous. Uh, because it's continuous, the absolute minimum is going to occur at either an end point or at a critical point. And the reason that that is true is the candidates test. So you don't usually need to name the candidates test, but I'm naming it anyway. So by the candidates test. All right, now, uh, we already know that g prime is f prime minus one. Uh, but we need the critical points, right? So we need to know when that is equal to zero. That's equal to zero, we could visually see, um, because we did the work in the previous part, at x equals five and at x equals seven, right? That's where those intersect each other. That's where f prime is equal to one, um, which will make g prime equal zero. So at x equals five, x equals seven. Now I need to figure out uh, the values at the endpoints and at the critical points. Now there's an alternative solution that's actually probably a little easier, and that would be that you just show that g prime changes from negative to positive at x equals five. And if it's the only critical point, then it must be the absolute minimum as well. But I'm gonna use the candidates test, I'm invested. Uh, I'm gonna make a table, I got x, I have g of x. We found most of what we need in previous parts, right? We need f of zero uh, minus zero. But f of zero from part a was three plus two pi. So that's gonna just be three plus two pi. For f of five, we found that in part a as well. We got that that was um, f of five is 3.5, but then minus the x-coordinate, so minus five. So that's negative 1.5. And then at seven, we have to actually do some work, right? So it's going to be, remember f is uh, three plus the integral from four to seven. So. I'm gonna do three plus the integral from four to seven. Basically, I've created another problem here where I need to find f of seven. Um, so I'm gonna find f of seven by doing three plus the integral from four to seven of f prime. And then I'm gonna subtract seven because I have to subtract x. So this is going to be, uh, that region right there is two, and that region is 1.5, so 3.5. So it's three plus 3.5, and then minus seven. So that's 6.5 minus seven, that's negative 0.5. And so I'm gonna say, therefore, the absolute minimum is negative 1.5 at x equals five. That's the entire question. Okay, in this video, we are gonna do number four from the Calc AB and Calc BC 2022 AP calculus exams. Um, and it's a table problem where you do kind of typical table problem things. So let's look at the problem. A nice sculpture melts in such a way that it can be modeled as a cone that maintains a conical shape as it decreases in size. The radius of the base of the cone is given by a twice differentiable function r, where r of t is measured in centimeters and t is measured in days. The table above, or below in my case, gives selected values of r prime of t, the rate of change of the radius over the time interval from zero to 12. All right, part A, 
is weird because they tell you exactly what to do. They say approximate R double prime of 8.5. Usually that's where the question just stops, but this continues using the average rate of change of R prime over the interval from seven to 10, show the computations that lead to the answer and indicate units of measure. All right, so average rate of change is algebra one slope. So we're gonna say that R double prime of 8.5 is approximately, they told us what to do, to use the average rate of change on uh, seven to 10. So it's gonna be R prime of 10 minus R prime of seven over 10 minus seven. And then we just have to pull values from the table so uh, R prime of 10 is negative 3.8. R prime of seven is negative 4.4. I feel like in recent years, they've been using a lot of decimals on the non-calculator section as if to emphasize that you don't have to simplify and maybe you should never try to simplify these numerical values. Um, so we're gonna sub in. So this, our calculation, is going to be negative 3.8 minus negative 4.4 over three. So, According to the rules, we do not need to simplify that, and we shouldn't, because we're probably going to get it wrong if we do. Not necessarily, but I mean, think of all the pressure you're under on, during the exam. So just leave that and throw your units on it. But if you don't stop there, uh, you do get negative 0.6 divided by 3, which is negative 0.2. And then our units are going to be the units of R prime, which are centimeters per day, divided by the units of time, which are days. So I'm going to write that as centimeters per day per day you could also do centimeters per day squared i just think it's harder to interpret that so i always write centimeters per day per day um, and it's totally fine all right let's look at the next one is there a time t between zero and three for which r prime of t is equal to negative six and we have to justify our answer so when i see this i usually think this is either going to be mvt or ivt since the table that I have is for r prime of t, I'm thinking that it's going to be ivt. If the table that I had was for r of t, I would think mvt, because mvt moves down a level and ivt kind of stays on the same level. All right, so to use ivt, I need r prime to be continuous, and therefore I need to establish that r prime is continuous. Well, they gave us that information indirectly by telling us that r is twice differentiable. So I'm going to start with that. So I'm going to say... Since r is twice differentiable, that means that r prime is differentiable. And if r prime is differentiable, it is therefore continuous. So I've established that r prime is continuous, which means intermediate value theorem applies. All right, now I just need to, I mean, they told us from zero to three, so we only have to look at those. Uh, I'm gonna find those values. So that's r prime of zero is negative 6.1, and r prime of three is negative five. So negative 6.1 is less than negative six, and negative five is greater than, so we can do this. I'm gonna write in my work though, those values, because remember, we're trying to like establish that we know what we're doing and show perfect work or as close to perfect as we can get. You never know what's gonna happen. Um, so I've shown this and now I'm just gonna make the statement that R prime of zero is less than negative six and R prime of three is greater than negative six. Therefore, R prime of T must equal negative six for some t value between zero and three. And the reason I know that's true is because of the intermediate value theorem. So I needed the function to be continuous. I needed to be below the value, above the value, and therefore I would hit the value. All right, next up, this is going to be, uh, use a right Riemann sum with four sub intervals indicated in the table to approximate the value of the integral from zero to 12 of R prime of T dt. This is a pretty straightforward problem. Um, again, though, because of all the decimals, I would definitely not simplify this answer. I would just write it out and you can leave the, the product and sums and, and just move on with life and know that you got the point. Because if you simplify and you get it wrong, even if your work was correct prior to that, you will lose the point. You don't want to lose points needlessly doing things that you don't need to do. All right, so we're using a right Riemann sum. So the first interval, we're going from zero to three, that's three. And then it's a right Riemann sum, so we take the right value, which is negative five. Then we're gonna go from three to seven, which is four units long. And we'll use the right endpoint, which is negative 4.4. Then we go from seven to 10, which is three units long. The right endpoint, negative 3.8. And finally, we go from 10 to 12, which is two units. And then the right endpoint is negative 3.5. Okay, you should stop there. That's all you have to do. 
I personally have like an issue with stopping, so I went ahead and I said that that actually equals negative 51, but we should really leave it unsimplified. There's no reason to simplify that. I'm trying to hammer that home to everybody. You don't need to simplify those values. Maybe in the future they'll change that, but I kind of doubt it. All right, next up. The height of the cone decreases at a rate of, so it's the same, you know, given information. That's why I'm not reading that. The height of the cone decreases at a rate of two centimeters per day. Um, at time t equals three days, the radius is 100, the height is 50. Find the rate of change of the volume of the cone um, with respect to time in cubic centimeters per day. So they're just giving you the units at time t equals three days. And then they give you the formula for volume. Uh, they pretty much always do that, so you can kind of count on that. Uh, so what do we do? We are trying to find the rate of change of volume with respect to time. That would be dv dt. We're looking for dv dt. We also know volume is pi over 3, r squared h. All right, so I'm going to find dv dt, which means everything needs to be a function of t. So I am basically using uh, implicit differentiation here, right? So pi over 3, quantity. I like to take that coefficient and just factor it out. And I'm going to do parentheses. And now I'm really dealing with r squared times h. I'm going to use the product rule because it's a product. So first is r squared times the derivative of the second, dh dt, plus second, which is h, times derivative of the first, which is going to be 2r, and then dr dt. So that is using implicit differentiation. Um, this is like a related rates type of problem, but implicit is how I, I view this. Now we need values to plug in. So we're going to go hunting through the problem. All right, well, uh, we need uh, dh dt, we need h, we need r, we need dr dt. Well, the height of the cone decreases at a rate of 2 centimeters per day, so that's going to be dh dt, and you're decreasing, which means that's going to be negative 2. Um, next up, we need h. Well, they tell us that the height is 50, so h is 50. We're going to need r, but that's like given as well, so the radius is 100, so r is 100. And then we need dr dt, so we need to realize that the table gives us r prime of t, which is dr dt. So we need r prime of 3, which is going to be um, right there. And uh, that'll give us dr dt is negative 5. All right, and now we're just going to sub in. So dv dt is going to be pi over 3, the quantity. And I'm just subbing in 100 squared negative 2 plus 50 times 2 times 100 times negative 5. And you know what I'm going to tell you to do right now? Stop, right? Just throw the units on there. You don't even really need units in this because they gave them to you. Put the units in there. Move on with your day. You save a lot of time. Also, this is kind of a gross one to simplify, and you don't need to simplify it. But of course, I did. So you should stop right before that. You shouldn't do this, but if you do go on, you will get negative 70,000 pi over three cubic centimeters per day. So that's what we're getting there. Um, all right, so that's the entirety of this question. Okay, in this video, we are gonna be doing number five from the 2022 Calc AB exam, and it's a differential equation problem, and it's pretty straightforward. So let's see what we can do. All right, consider the differential equation in dy dx is one half sine of pi over two x times the square root of y plus seven. Let y equals f of x be the particular solution to the differential equation with the initial condition f of 1 equals 2. The function f is defined for all real numbers. All good. All right. Part A. A portion of the slope field for the differential equation is given below. Sketch the solution curve through the point 1, 2. All right. So when you are sketching a solution curve, I like to picture the slope field as if it is flowing water. You jump into the water at the given point and you just follow the contours, right? So it looks like when we get to two, we're gonna have like a relative maximum. When we get to negative two, it looks like it'll be a relative maximum. When we get to zero, it looks like we'll have a relative minimum. Let's just follow the contours. I think that's pretty good. And now I'm gonna go the other way. So when I get to zero, I want a minimum. When I get to negative two, I want a maximum. I think that's all you're really looking for there. I mean, this it, the slope field definitely suggests that the solution should look like an even function, and we have that. Nothing more to say. Let's, let's move on to the next part. All right, so write an equation for the line tangent to the solution curve in part A at the point 1, 2. Use the equation to approximate f of point 8. All right, so we're going to need the slope. We're going to write the tangent line, and then we're going to approximate f of point 8. Here goes. 
For this loop, we're just evaluating dy dx at the ordered pair one, two. So typically you would have y as a function, y prime is a function of x and you just need to know x. Here, dy dx is a function of x and y, so we need to know both x and y. But it's straight substitution. Every x I see becomes a one. Every y I see becomes a two. So I get one half sine of pi over two, radical two plus seven. We know the sine of pi over two is one and we know the square root of nine is three. So we get one half times one and times three, which is three halves. And there you go, that's our slope. Now for the tangent line. We know the ordered pair is one, two, because we know that f of one is equal to two. So we're gonna say y minus two is three halves the quantity x minus one. That's our tangent line. Now we want to approximate f of 0.8. So f of 0.8 is approximately, it's not equal to this, it's approximately two plus 1.5 times. We plug in 0.8, we get 0.8 minus one is negative 0.2. And remember, we can stop there. We don't need to get a value for this. We can just leave it as it is, but I have an issue with that. So I'm gonna say, stop where you are, move on to the next part. But if you don't, you should get that F of 0.8 is approximately 1.7. Okay, next up. It is known that F double prime is greater than zero for X between negative one and one. Is the approximation found in part B an overestimate or an underestimate for f of 0.8? Give a reason for your answer. All right, so they're actually giving us the concavity. Thank goodness, right? Because otherwise we would need to find the second derivative, which would involve uh, the product rule and some implicit and like, it wouldn't be pretty. But they're just telling us that it's greater than zero, so we're good. Um, so I'm gonna say, since f double prime is greater than zero on the interval from negative one to one, we know that f of x is concave up. Now we could go straight from that to whether it's an over or underestimate because we know concave up gives an underestimate. Um, but I like to go one step further and I like to say, therefore the tangent line is below the curve. I do that because I sometimes actually screw this up and I don't want to do that. So I'm saying, therefore the tangent line is below the curve. And if you are below the curve, you are underestimating the value. So we have underestimated the value, and that's the answer to that. There's nothing more that we need to do. All right, next part, which I imagine was worth the bulk of the points on this problem, is use separation of variables, which is also unique. Usually they don't tell you that. They just say, find the particular solution, and then they will say, you get no points if you don't use separation of variables. But here they're saying, use separation of variables to find y equals f of x, the particular solution to the differential equation dy dx equals one half sine of pi over two x times the square root of x, uh, nope, sorry, y plus seven with the initial condition f of one equals two. I feel like that took me so long to read. All right, we got to separate and integrate. So uh, separation of variables, dy over the square root of y plus two is one half sine of pi over two x dx. All right, so now integrate both sides. So we have this. On the left-hand side, I like to rewrite that as the quantity y plus seven to the negative one half. So I'm actually gonna do that. Um, I'm showing more work than I like personally would probably show. I usually would, in my initial step, I would have written uh, the integral of quantity y plus seven to the negative one half dy, but it's totally fine. I'm gonna actually do the integral on the right-hand side. So if you were doing this with u substitution, I would say u is pi over two x, which means that du is pi over two dx, or two over pi du is equal to dx, and I would go from there. Um, but what I'm gonna choose to do instead is say that because of the pi over two x, there should have been a pi over two on the inside, which means there would be a two over pi on the outside. So I would have the one half that's there, a two over pi, and then the integral of sine of pi over two x should be negative cosine of pi over two x, and we put plus C on the side with the independent variable. So that's why plus C is on that side. I didn't even integrate the left-hand side yet, so I'm gonna do that. So plus one times the reciprocal gives me this. And on this side, we can clean it up a little while, we, while we're here, All right? So we get negative one over pi, cosine of pi over two X plus C. Now is a good time to solve for C because when else are you gonna do it? So I know that the ordered pair is one, two, so one, two gives me two times uh, nine to the one half equals negative one over pi cosine of pi over two. But we know the cosine of pi over two is zero. So really we are getting two times three is six 
is equal to C. So we know the value of C and we know um, we know a, a, a thing, right? We know two quantity y plus seven to the one half equals blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna copy that over onto a new page just for space. So this is what we have right now. We need to solve for y because we need to get y is equal to a function of x. So I'm gonna methodically do that. Step one, I'm just gonna replace c with six. Now I'm gonna divide everything I see by two. So I get y plus seven to the one half is negative one over two pi cosine of pi over two x plus three because I'm dividing everything by two. Then I'm gonna square both sides and get y plus seven. I do the, I always do like a million steps on these because I don't wanna accidentally screw something up. I mean, nobody wants to accidentally screw something up. So show as many steps as you need. I feel personally that I need a lot of steps when I'm solving for y. I don't know why. Um, and then I'm just gonna subtract seven. So we get negative seven plus the quantity uh, negative one over two pi, cosine of pi over two x, and then plus three, and then the whole thing squared. That's my solution. So that's y or y equals f of x. All right, that is our differential equation problem. Okay, in this video, we are gonna do number six from the 2022 Calc A, B, AP Calculus exam. And this is a particle motion problem, I guess, where we have two particles moving, which is kind of becoming a theme on the exam. So let's see how this goes. Particle P moves along the x-axis such that for time t greater than zero, its position is given by x sub P of t. I hate that they're using these subscripts for everything, but they've been doing it for a couple years now. x sub P of t is equal to six minus four e to the negative t. Particle Q moves along the y-axis. So one of them is moving horizontally, the other one's moving vertically. Um, particle Q moves along the y-axis such that for time t greater than zero, its velocity is given by v sub q of t, which I'm just gonna say vq of t from now on, is one over t squared. At time t equals one, the position of the particle q is yq of one equals two. So that's all given information. Part A, find vp of t, the velocity of particle p at time t. Great question. Um, so vp of t is going to be equal to x prime p of t. You have to write that these days. You didn't have to use to write that, but now you do. So make sure you're, you're clearly stating the relationship between velocity and position. So we've done that, and now we just have to find uh, VP of T. So XP of T up here is six minus four E to the negative T. The derivative of six is zero. The derivative of E to the negative T is negative E to the negative T. So we have negative four times negative E to the negative T. We just get four E to the negative T. That's part A, that's the whole thing. Uh, I noticed that this year they have parts A through D on basically every question, and I think that's why some of the parts were like, like why are you even asking me this type of things, but here we go. Find A Q of T, the acceleration of particle Q at time T. Then find all times T greater than zero when the speed of particle Q is decreasing and justify your answer. All right, so same thing, we have to connect acceleration to velocity so I'm gonna start off with a q of t is v prime q of t. Um, and then I need to take the derivative of one over t squared because v q of t is one over t squared. So that's going to be uh, t to the negative second, bring down the exponent, subtract one. So that's negative two t to the negative third. I'm gonna say that a q of t is negative two over t cubed. So negative two over t cubed. And what I did there was I rewrote this in my head as t to the negative second. And then I used the power rule, right? Bring the exponent down, subtract one. I didn't like the negative exponent, so I made it one over t cubed. All right, so final answer, negative two over t cubed, of course. All right, find all times t when the speed is decreasing. All right, so for speed to be decreasing, I need velocity and acceleration to have opposite signs. So if we look at this, uh, vq of t is one over t squared, and one over t squared is greater than zero for all t greater than zero. So velocity is always positive. So now I just need to figure out where acceleration is negative, but uh, a q of t we just found was negative two over t cubed, and if t is positive, then negative two divided by a positive is negative, so a q of t is less than zero for all t greater than zero. So these things have opposite signs everywhere, which means the speed is always decreasing. So I'm just gonna write that. 
So since v q of t and a q of t have opposite signs for t greater than zero, the speed of q is decreasing for all t greater than zero. I don't ever remember that being the case before. Kind of a neat problem. Um, let's take a look at the next part. So for the next part, find y q of t, the position of the particle q at time t. So I like to use the fundamental theorem when I'm solving these problems. So I'm going to set it up like an accumulation function. I'm going to say that um, our velocity is 1 over t squared. So y q of t should be where we start, which is 2, plus the displacement. The displacement is the integral from 1 to t of v q of t. So it's going to be the integral from 1 to t. v q of, I need a dummy variable, so I'm going to use u. So I'm going to say that uh, I need to integrate the velocity, which would be 1 over u squared. I'm writing it as u to the negative second du because I have to integrate. So why not use a negative exponent because it makes it easier. And now we just do it. So it's going to be 2. Uh, the antiderivative of u to the negative second plus 1 times the reciprocal is negative u to the negative 1. So I'm going to say the quantity, negative u to the negative 1, from 1 to 2, t, not 2. And then uh, I'm going to do 2, parentheses, plug in t gives me negative t to the negative 1, minus parentheses, plug in 1 gives me negative 1. So then when I simplify this, I get y q of t is, I have a 2 minus negative 1 is 3, so 3 minus 1 over t. All right, so that's part c. Uh, we're going to actually need that answer in part d. So no matter what you got, you're going to take your answer to part c into part d and try to work with it. Hopefully you got it correct so that you're bringing the correct thing over, but no matter what you do, bring it with you. All right, next. As t approaches infinity, which particle will eventually be farther from the origin? Now remember, x is on, um, x is just on the x-axis and y is just on the y-axis. So one's on a horizontal, one's on a vertical. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna look at uh, the limit as t approaches infinity of their position. So x versus y. So I'm gonna look at first, the limit as t approaches infinity of x p of t, which is going to be the limit as t approaches infinity of the quantity 6 minus 4 e to the negative t. But for the purpose of limits, it's better to write it as 4 over e to the t because 4 is not growing. e to the t is growing to infinity. So we basically have 6 minus 0, which gives us 6. All right, so that's where x is going to be 6 units from the origin. Uh, now y, we're going to take the limit as t approaches infinity of y q of t, and that's going to be the limit. So we're importing this from the last part, t approaches infinity of 3 minus 1 over t. Now, 1 over t as t approaches infinity definitely goes to 0, which means this will just give us 3. And uh, so that's on the y-axis, and x is on the x-axis. Um, so six is bigger than three. I don't know what I'm supposed to do to like connect this at this point. I think my reason is that six is bigger than three. I'm just going to say, therefore, P will eventually be farther from the origin. Um, I don't know if I was supposed to do a, a longer sentence or something there. I will update that with a comment, uh, later if that happens. But, uh, for now, that's the end of it. So I hope you found this helpful and good luck.